it's Miss Rowe, and I am so excited that I get to read chapter 17 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to you. So I don't know about you, but I have been loving every single chapter of this book, and I am so excited to see how it ends. So without further ado, let's get started. So chapter 17 is called The Hunting of the White Stag. Hmm. The battle was all over after a few, a few minutes after their arrival. Most of the enemy had been killed in the first charge of Aslan and his companions. And when those who were still living saw that the witch was dead, they either gave themselves up or took to flight. The next thing that Lucy knew was that Peter and Aslan were shaking hands. It was strange to see to her to see Peter looking as he looked now. His face was so pale and stern and he seemed so much older. It was all Edmund's doing, Aslan, Peter was saying. We'd have been beaten if it hadn't been for him. The witch was turning our troops into stone right and left, but nothing would stop him. He fought his way through three ogres to where she was just turning one of your leopards into a statue. And when he reached her, he had, to, he had sense to bring his sword smashing down on her wand instead of trying to go for her directly and simply getting made a statue himself for his pains. That was the mistake all the rest were making. Once her wand was broken, we began to have some chance. If we hadn't lost so many already, he was terribly wounded. We must go and see him. They found Edmund in charge of Mrs. Beaver, a little way back from the fighting line. He was covered with blood, his mouth was open, and his face a nasty green color. Quick, Lucy, said Aslan, and then, almost for the first time, Lucy remembered the precious cordial that had been given her for a Christmas present. Her hands trembled so much that she could hardly undo the stopper, but she managed it in the end and poured a few drops into her brother's mouth. There are other people wounded, said Aslan, while she was still looking eagerly into Edmund's pale face and wondering if the cordial would have any result. Yes, I know, said Lucy crossly. Wait a minute. Daughter of Eve, said Aslan in a, greater, in a graver voice. Others are at the point of death. Must more people die for Edmund? I'm sorry, Aslan, said Lucy, getting up and going with him. And for the next half hour, they were busy, she attending to the wounded while he restored those who had been turned into stone. When at last she was free to come back to Edmund, she found him standing on his feet and not only healed of his wounds, but looking better than she had seen him look, oh, for ages. In fact, ever since his first term at that horrid school, which was where he had begun to go wrong, he had become his real old self again and could look you in the face. And there on the field of battle, Aslan made him a knight. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslan did for him? Does he know what the arrangement with the witch really was? Hush, no, of course not, said Susan. Oughtn't he to be told, said Lucy? Oh, surely not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. Think of how you would feel if you were he. All the same, I think he ought to know, said Lucy. But at that moment, they were interrupted. That night, they slept where they were. How Asim provided food for them all, I don't know. But somehow or other, they found themselves all sitting down on the grass to a fine high tea at about eight o'clock. Next day, they began marching eastward down the side of the great river. And the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth. The castle of Ker Paravel on its little hill towered up above them. Before there were the sands with rocks and little pools of salt water and seaweed and the smell of the sea and long miles of bluish green waves breaking forever and ever on the beach. And oh, the cry of seagulls. Have you heard it? Can you remember? That evening after tea, the four children all managed to get down to the beach again and get their shoes and stockings off and feel the sand between their toes. But next day was more solemn. For then, in the great hall of Cara Paravel, that wonderful hall with the ivory roof and the west wall hung with peacock's feathers and the eastern door which looks towards the sea. In the presence of all their friends and to the sound of trumpets, Aslan solemnly crowned them and led them to the four thrones amid deafening shouts of, Long live King Peter! Long live Queen Susan! Long live King Edmund! Long live 
Queen Lucy. Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, sons of Adam. Bear it well, daughters of Eve, said Aslan. And through the eastern door, which was wide open, came the voices of the mermen and the mermaids swimming close to the shore and singing in honor of their new kings and queens. So the children sat on their thrones and scepters were put into their hands and they gave rewards and honors to all their friends, to Tumnus the fawn and to the beavers and giant Rumblebuffin, to the leopards and the good centaurs and the good dwarfs and to the lion. And that night there was a great feast in Care Paravel and revelry and dancing and gold flashed and wine flowed and answering to the music inside. But stranger, sweeter, and more piercing came the music of the sea people. But amid all these rejoicings, Aslan himself quietly slipped away. And when the kings and queens noticed that he wasn't there, they said nothing about it. For Mr. Beaver had warned them, he'll be coming and going, he had said. One day you'll see him and another you won't. He doesn't like being tied down. And of course, he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop in, only you must impress him. He's wild, you know, not like a tame lion. And now, as you see, this story is nearly, but not quite, at an end. These two kings and two queens governed Narnia well, and long and happy was their reign. At first, much of their time was spent in seeking out the remnants of the White Witch's army and destroying them. And indeed, for a long time, there would be news of evil things lurking in the wilder parts of the forest a haunting here and a killing there, a glimpse of a werewolf one month and a rumor of a hag the next. But in the end, all that foul brood was stamped out and they made good laws and kept the peace and saved good trees from being unnecessarily cut down and liberated young dwarfs and young satyrs from being sent to school and generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. And they drove back to the fierce giants, quite a different sort from giant Rumblebuffin on the north of Narnia, when these ventured across the frontier. And they entered into friendship and alliance with countries beyond the sea and paid them visits of state and received visits of state from them. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. And Peter became a tall and deep chested man and a great warrior. And he was called King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet. And the kings of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage. And she was called Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter and great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. But as for Lucy, she was always gay and golden haired and all princes in the parts desired her to be their queen and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy and if ever they remembered their life in this world it was only as one remembers a dream and one year it fell out that Tumnus who was a middle-aged fawn by now and beginning to be stout came down river and brought them news that the white stag had once more appeared in his parts the white stag who would give you wishes if you caught him. So these two kings and two queens, with their principal members of their court, rode a hunting with horns and hounds in the western woods to follow the white stag. And they had not hunted long before they had a sight of him. And he led them a great pace over rough and smooth and through thick and thin till the horses of all the, cour the couriers were tired out and only these four were still following. And they saw the stag enter into a thicket where their horses could not flow. Then said King Peter, for they talked in quite a different style now, having been kings and queens for so long. Fair consorts, let us now light from our horses and follow this beast into the thicket, for in all my days I never hunted a nobler quarry. Sir, said the others, even so let us do. So they alighted and tied their horses to trees and went on into the thick wood on foot. And as soon as they had entered it, Queen Susan said, Fair friends, here is a great marvel, for I seem to see a tree of iron. 
Madam, said King Edmund, if you look well upon it, you shall see it is a pillar of iron with a lantern set on top of thereof. By the lion's mane, a strange device, said King Peter, to set a lantern here, where the trees cluster so thick about it and so high above it that if it were lit, it should give light to no man. Sir, said Queen Lucy, by likelihood when this post and this lamp were set here, there were smaller trees in the place, or fewer or none. For this is a young wood, and the iron post is old, and they stood looking upon it. Then said King Edmund, I know not how it is, but this lamp on the post worketh upon me strangely. It runs in my mind that I have seen the like before, as it were in a dream, or in the dream of a dream. Sir, answered they all, it is even so with us also. And more, said Queen Lucy, for it will not go out of my mind that if we pass this post and lantern either we shall find strange adventures or else some great change of our fortunes. Madam, said King Edmund, the like foreboding stirreth in my heart also. And in mine, fair brother, said King Peter, and in mine too, said Queen Susan. Wherefore, by my counsel, we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further. Madam, said King Peter, therein I pray thee to have me excused, for never since we four were kings and queens in Narnia have we set our hands to any high matter, as battles, quests, feats of arms, acts of justice, and the like, and then given over, but always what we have taken in hand, the same we have achieved. Sister, said Queen Lucy, my royal brother speaks rightly, and it seems to me that we should be shamed if for any fearing or foreboding we turned back from following so noble a beast as now we have in chase. And so say I, said King Edmund, and I have such desire to find the signification of this thing that I would not, by my good will, turn back for the richest jewel in all Narnia and all the islands. Then in the name of Aslan, said Queen Susan, if ye will all have it so, let us go on and take the adventure that shall fall to us. So these kings and queens entered the thicket, and before they had gone a score of paces, they all remembered that the thing they had seen was called a lamp post. And before they had gone twenty more, they noticed that they were making their way through branches, not through branches, but through coats. And the next moment, they all came tumbling out of a wardrobe door into the empty room. And they were no longer kings and queens in their hunting array, but just Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy in their old clothes. It was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide. Mrs. McCready and the visitors were still talking in the passage, but luckily they never came into the empty room, and so the children weren't caught. And that would have been the very end of the story if it hadn't been that they felt they really must explain to the professor why four of the coats out of his wardrobe were missing. And the professor, who was a very remarkable man, didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies, but believed the whole story. No, he said. I don't think it will be any good trying to go back through the wardrobe door to get the coats. You won't get into Narnia again by that route, nor would the coats be much use by now if you did. Eh? What's that? Yes, of course you'll get back to Narnia again someday. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. But don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. And don't talk too much about it, even among yourselves. And don't mention it to anyone unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort themselves. What's that? How will you know? Oh, you'll know all right. Odd things, they say, even their looks, will let the secret out. Keep your eyes open. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? And that is the very end of the adventure of the wardrobe. But if the professor was right, it was only the beginning of the adventures of Narnia. I hope that you enjoyed chapter 17 and it was the ending that you had all expected and hoped for. And I thank you again for listening to me read it. Bye, Erwin.